In this video, I'm going to be going through uh, HSC Engineering Studies. This is Year 12 content. This is Chapter 2. We're going to be looking at uh, the continuing on with personal and public transport, and we're looking specifically at materials. We're going to be looking at non-ferrous alloys. We're going to be looking at ceramics and polymers and their application and manufacturing processes that are used in relation to uh, transport. So to, f to start off with, we're going to start with aluminium. And in this window, you can see that I have um, different forms of, uh, so different al aluminium alloys. Now, so the alloys are all numbered with a four digit number and where we can learn a lot just from the first digit can tell us what kind of alloy it's going to be. So all of them are going to be mostly aluminium. That's why they're aluminium alloys. But, um, what we're going to, uh, where the, if we say, for instance, we use the 2000 series, which we'll learn more about when we get to, I'm just going to move the screen down, sorry. When with 2000 series, which we'll learn more about when we get to aviation. So for instance, the 2017, um, 2017 is an aluminium alloy that is mostly aluminium, but 2% copper. And this is a really important aluminium alloy. It's so famous, it's got its own name, which is Duralumin, right? I often mispronounce that, but we're just going to call it 2017 from now on. 2017 has been replaced by another aluminium alloy with about 2% copper. Now it's been replaced with 2024, right? But the reason we use this, well, we're going to look at why we use these different alloys. But first, we're just going to introduce the, the idea that there's seven different families of aluminium alloys. The first one is pure aluminium, which means that it's 99% aluminium or more. It can have less than 1% non-aluminium, right? So pure aluminium. Number two is copper. So here I have a two cent piece to remember to help you remember the idea that when people say, I'll give you my two cents. So copper, um, the two cent pieces were made out of copper. I don't know if anyone remembers two cent pieces, but if you can think of two one cent American US um, cents, they're made out of copper as well. So copper, that's how I remember that the 2000 series has copper. All right. Number three is manganese. I don't have any opinions on manganese. Number four is silicon. So I've got four silly skeletons. That helps me to remember. Um, in other versions of this, uh, this meme where there are errors, you can see that I've got, um, the Chinese superstition for, um, they don't like to say the number four, right? Which is a silly superstition that they don't like the number four. And it actually sounds like SI, which is, um, the number is, the number is sir, and then the word for death is sir. And anyway, but four silly skeletons, I'm going to run with that. It's a book, right? I just cropped out the, the, um, the title and the author of the book, four silly skeletons. Five and six, this is the interesting one. They're both, they both have some amount of not manganese, not mango, magnesium. And what's he got there? He's got a big gun. What gun, what's that gun called? It's the biggest handgun in the world, right? Is the magnum, right? And, Depending on um, if it's five or six, there's either going to be pure, just ma um, magnesium on its own, or if it's five, it's silicon and magnesium. So we'll look at that together. And um, so we'll go through here. Uh, and then lastly is zinc. I'm going to come back to these. Right. So let's have a look. So there's aluminium alloys. Um, aluminium alloys are important. Let's have a look. So number one is primarily pure aluminium with small amounts of iron or silicon used for sheet metal work. Okay, we said uh, up to 1% uh, non-aluminium. Uh, so three, now you'll notice this has gone in a weird order. So three, they've used manganese, not magnesium, manganese. What's it used for? Um, pressure vessels, chemical uh, containers, um, and for also for sheet metal work. Five is magnesium, and uh, it can have some amounts of other stuff. Uh, it's used in trucking and marine applications. And here we have two, six, and seven. So two, we've already talked about at some length about copper. We've, uh, so the family includes Duralumin, which is 2017, which I said had 2% copper, actually it's 4% copper. So sorry, um, I, I was wrong on that one. Um, there's the 6000 series, which we said has magnesium and silicon. So I'm going to tell you a story to help you remember that, that in the movie Dirty Harry, he uh, he's in a gunfight. He's actually eating a sandwich, and he sees a bank robber, and he goes over and he starts shooting at the bank robbers, and he, he wings the guy right. And the guy is on the ground, and he's got a shotgun, and he says, "I know what you. I know you want to get that shotgun, but you're uh, you're thinking to yourself, did I fire five shots or six? Well, 
As a matter of fact, in all that excitement, I kind of lost track myself. The question you got to ask yourself is, do you feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? Right? So the question is, if it's five shots, well, that's not silly, because he's still got one in the chamber, right? He's still okay. He's going to blow the guy's head clean off. He makes a comment about, you know, the 365 Magnum is the biggest gun in the world. Blow your head clean off. I have no idea what the number is. I think it's something like that. Um, but if he'd fired six shots, well, then that's that that's pretty silly, right? Because if you fired shit six shots, if you fired six shots, it means you got you just you, you're waving around a prop, right? Yeah, you know, without the bullets, the gun doesn't do much. You might as well throw it at their head, right? So five, you're safe. Six, you're silly. Yep, that's what we're running with. So help us remember the Magnum, right? Five, we're safe. Six, you're silly. And this ties back into our silly skeletons that it helps us to remember silly. Also, you can remember six is silly, right? So both of them have magnesium, but six is silly. So there's some mnemonics to help you remember. I am unlikely to ask you what is the chief alloying element in anything other than the 2000 series, because that is a question I have seen a lot. So if they said, what two, um, so aluminum, there are a variety of aluminum alloys. 2016 is an alloy commonly used in aviation, and 2017 is an alloy commonly used in um, aviation. What is the other um, principal element in that alloy? You'd all be able to answer. The answer is copper. Good answer, everyone. Okay, I'm unlikely to ask you anything other than the 2000 series just because the 2000 series is so important. So if you want to write down a note as to which one to remember, 2000 series being copper is the one that you need to remember. But for the other uh, for the other values, I'm not as concerned. Now, lastly, we've got seven. Seven is zinc. Now, how do you remember that seven is zinc? Well, I try to remember that seven looks a bit like a Z. That might help you. There's also a file extractor that I use to extract um, you know, my RAR files or whatever, um, my zip files, and that's called 7-zip. And it's you know, a free software that you can use to unzip uh, files or to compress files. Um, for me, initially, I just said that, hey, the 7 looks like a Z. You could also say that 7 sounds a bit like Z, right? It doesn't, but, you know, like we're working here with what mnemonics we can come up with. So I'm trying to chuck out a few things so maybe something sticks. Okay, we didn't talk. We skipped back over 7. We didn't get to that one. So why do we use zinc? Um, it's worth mentioning that there is some amounts of other stuff, but we can't remember everything. So we want to just focus on that 7 is zinc right we don't want to worry about there's also some amounts of other stuff that's why there's you know a hundred possible uh, um, combinations in the 7000 series so what have we got um why do we use this it's good in aircrafts um and has because it has very strong strengths um it we'll talk about here it, so we'll notice here that we have um fo the fire emoji on three of them right and you notice that when we looked at the textbook they grouped three together and then then they grouped um another three together. Why did they group two, six, and seven together? Well, they're all the fire ones. Why do we have the fire emojis? Because they can be heat treated. Specifically, does anyone remember, we talked about this last year, what kind of heat treatment can we use with aluminium? Starts with a P. And if we go back to our book, we can see here, precipitation hardening. All right now, I'm not going to go into detail on precipitation hardening. I have covered that in another video when we talked about cast iron and stainless steel. In the video on stainless steel, I talked about cast um, precipitation hardening. We did that in bio um, chapter four of the uh, preliminary course, biomedical in, in, um, engineering. But the 7000 series is the one that uh, it can form dense precipitates, which makes it very strong, right? So it's the strongest of our aluminium alloys at 500 megapascals. Um, why do we use the 6000 series? Good corrosion resistance, but it also can be um, heat treated. Uh, so bike frames are suitable for 6 and 7. I am unlikely to, again, to ask you about anything other than 2000 series, but I do have to cover the other ones just so that we've covered our bases because I don't write the HSC and I don't know what they're going to ask. If I said compare the 2000, 6000 and 7000 series to the other aluminium alloys, you would say, these are the alloys that can be heat, tra uh, that can be heat treated. They can be precipitation, uh, precipitation hardened. Now, let's say that you weren't happy with my video on precipitation hardening. That's fair enough, right? It's not a thing. I'm not a metallurgist. It's not a thing I'm an expert in. What you can do is you can watch this video by an Irish guy. I think this is real engineering. 
um, the material that changed the world. And he starts off by talking about the Wright brothers. And the Wright brothers, they had a secret weapon when they built their planes that they painted their engines black because they didn't want to know, they didn't want people to know what magical material they were using for such lightweight engines. And that was aluminium, a relatively new material, or right? a material that had only been used in any widespread application for about 50 years. Uh, in this video, he also talks about, um, the apocryphal story about uh, Napoleon the Third using um, replacing the aluminium, uh, sorry, giving the, the the richest guests aluminium cutlery instead of gold cutlery. Anyway, so he talks. A lot, this video is mostly about precipitation hardening, and if that's something that you want to look into, um, then if you want to learn more about precipitation hardening, it's a video that is worth watching. Now, if you wanted to learn more about the applications of aluminium, we have this pretty good web website website called Aluminium Leader. I will include a comment um, in my Google Notes, in my Google Classroom. But we can see that aluminium is used in construction, engineering, uh, electrical engineering, consumer goods, and packaging. Presumably, everyone at some point in their life has drunk out of an aluminium can. My daughter doesn't drink so soft drinks, so maybe not. But presumably, at some point, she's drunk out of an aluminium can. Now, obviously, I've already spoken at great length. Or, or, sorry, I've already spoken multiple times, not great length, about how the 2000 series aluminium, specifically the 2017 or duralumin, is um, is famously used in uh, in planes. These days, I've said that we now use 2024 as the more um, the more advanced version of this alloy. But it's still worth mentioning that, um, that it's a famous uh, alloy. So here we can see the key aluminium alloys used in aviation, the 2000, 3000, 5000, 6000, 7000 series, right? Um, what we're going to focus on is, at the moment, we're talking about the automotion, automotive industry. Right, so it can be used for its lightweight, specifically in racing. These days, we're more likely to use carbon fiber, but um, it is something that is worth noting that when we want to uh, we want to reduce weight, we can use aluminium. So we can see a the uh, the latest all aluminium vehicle from Range Rover, right, is thirty nine um, percent or four hundred kilograms lighter than its steel predecessor. Uh, okay, so. The Teslas also incorporate aluminium. Rail also incorporates aluminium. I'm not going to go into too much detail here. I'm going to say, I'm going to leave this for homework for you to read this. There's no point me just reading things out on a video. Um, what I want to move on to is that electrical distribution, and in this course, we were interested in overhead wiring, right? How we get electricity from the power plant to the train. Well, we do that not using copper. Most people think that we use copper um, transmission lines and distribution network. But although copper is a good conductor, and we can see it's a noticeable... So the best conductor is silver. And we can see copper is just a little bit less good, but aluminium is noticeably less good at conducting than copper. But why do we use copper? Take a pot, a pot shot. What do, you, what do you think is the primary... Pop, what is the property we think of with aluminium? Yeah, oh, it's, light. it's light. Yeah, excellent. So it has low weight. Uh, it has a um, it has it has a low density, and in this particular case, it means that we can conduct the same amount of electricity with less load on the poles, right? And that's a good thing, right? When we're talking about kilometers and kilometers of cabling, right? We'd rather use aluminium. It's more cost effective to use aluminium, even though it's less good at conducting than it is to use copper. We're, we're going to accept that inefficiency because of the fact that it has other um, other savings okay so I think that's all I'm going to talk about with aluminium yep okay so we've talked about there is um, in the book they do talk about casting of aluminium I'm not really interested in going into a lot of detail I'm going to set that for homework I was almost going to skip over this um, so copper we've already talked about brass and bronze I expect you to know already about um, the difference between brass and bronze. We talked about how the bronze medals are from the Olympics. That's an old, old sport. And Tin Man is from an old story, right, uh, about a robot. Whereas, so we can remember that bronze and tin go together. Whereas brass is from the future, 
right? Brass, we use the saxophone is a new, it's a modern instrument and it's a brass instrument. Well, it's actually not a brass instrument. It's a woodwind, but we're going to ignore that. If we think about, um, you know, brass instruments that we think of them as being sort of modern and zinc is new. So zinc, we, you wear zinc when you play cricket. Cricket is a modern sport. And if you think of Futurama, right? So it's from the future. Zinc, um, Bender is actually made up of a lot of zinc. In one episode, he sells his body because uh, the price of zinc goes up. Okay. Actually, not true. I think it's titanium, but we're going to ignore that because of the sake it makes a good story. Okay. Um, now, aside from that, we're going to learn about heaps of different kinds of copper, like four different kinds of copper when we get to telecommunications. Um, but for the moment, I don't want to talk about like um, copper beryllium or uh, copper zirconium. We're going to instead just talk about very, I'm just going to highlight that there are some things like naval brass and um, gun metal, right? Which uh, I don't want to go into here. I'm going to set that for homework because I just don't see those as being common HSC questions. So it's easy for me to say, read this page, answer these two questions, and then I can feel, feel as though we've ticked it off. We don't need to spend a lot of time and effort really uh, memorizing this one. Um, it is interesting that they have um, they have interesting microstructures, but I don't want to go into that because, like I said, it's just it's not very commonly mentioned. Here they talk about precipitation hardening. I used this part of the textbook and I removed the aluminium parts and I changed the the. Uh, the temperatures when I did my stainless steel one. You might remember last year we all filled this in. We all drew the microstructures in our notes. I handed out um, booklets and we all filled these in. Um, okay, so that is uh, all we're talking about with non-ferrous alloys and now we're going to talk about ceramics. So ceramics, I use this picture of um, Ariel and um, friends. We've got some brick, we've got some ceramic, sorry, some cement based ceramics. We've got abrasive or cutting ceramics. We've got semiconductors and superconductors not shown. And we have uh, spark plugs. Now we're going to talk about glass in a second, but the first thing I really want to focus on is, I mean, like we just quickly remind, it's always good whenever we talk about bricks to talk about the process of vitrification. Vitrification is the uh, process of taking clay and turning it into um, a hard taking soft clay and making it hard by firing it um, and it comes from it shares it shares its origin with the, the French word for glass um, we talked about how we can press bricks or we can extrude bricks uh, but what we're going to focus on is we're going to get to glass in a second but we're going to focus on so vitrification I uh, what occurs in a brick I don't know why I have this here um, it really and it's not opening so it's probably a sign um, okay, spark plugs. Why are spark plugs so important for your engine? Well, what do spark plugs do? Okay, so what you might remember we talked briefly last year, right? About this time last year, we talked about the four-stroke process, right? Does anyone remember what those four strokes, four steps of the um, of a in a four-stroke engine? What are the four strokes? SSBB. Exactly right. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow. So we have intake, compression, power, and then exhaust. Now, to create the power, what we've done is we've taken a compressed air fuel mixture and then we, we ignite it, right? We cause it to explode. How do we cause it to explode? We cause it to explode through a spark, right? The spark plugs provide that spark. But it's important that what we want to do is we want to have um, a, an arc of electricity across the two light leads that are not touching but are close enough that the electricity can jump between them. So like lightning, but just on a tiny scale, like the arc welder, but, an, uh, but even on a smaller scale than that. Now, it's important that the ceramics that we use in spark plugs, they need to be um, very heat resistant and or, so they have to be very good conductors of heat and very good conductors of I said conductors, very poor conductors, very good insulators. I'm sorry, I'm hitting my head. People know that I made a mistake. They are very good insulators of both heat and electricity, and they're refractory. What does refractory mean? That they're stable at high temperatures, right? Because they're stable at high temperatures, it means they don't melt. If we used plastic spark plugs, it wouldn't work, right? They would melt. Um, okay, so it's spark plugs. Uh, now we're going to talk about glass, and so I usually post these links, um, all of these links to uh, to Google Classroom, but let's have a quick look at what we've got here. So we've got some videos. The first video we've seen before when we learn about tempered glass, will it shatter or will it not shatter? 
tempered glass, or also known as toughened glass. The process of making toughened glass is we cool it down rapidly with jets of water. Will it shatter? It does shatter. Where do we use tempered glass in cars? You want to take another guess? The side windows, right? Laminated glass, on the other hand, doesn't shatter, right? We want these side windows, they need to shatter. Why? Because when we, if we crash your car into a river, you need to be able to get out of the car. You can't open the door, so you're supposed to use the seatbelt or the headrest. You're supposed to take the headrest off your car, and you're supposed to use that to smash the window, right? And they're deliberately hardened so that they'll smash the window. On the other hand, the windshield, it's not supposed to break. So that if you hit a kangaroo or if you live in Canada, sometimes I use this opportunity to show how big moose are. Moose are ginormous, like they're ridiculously tall. Um, they're the major cause of fatalities on roads in Canada. Right, when you hit a moose, right, you don't want it to kick through the glass, right? You want to have as much impact resistance as you can, and that's why we use laminated glass. Laminated glass is a composite material where we have two pieces of glass, just regular soda lamb glass, but they're held together with a, an adhesive. In this case, it's a polymer, PVB. I'm going to say it's polyvinyl butyl, but I'm taking a bit of a guess there, right? When you hit a kangaroo, right? I mean, look, it's definitely not saying that a moose isn't going to go through that, but a kangaroo might bounce off it. Okay, so we then talked about the process of just making regular um, everyday glass, the glass that we use in bottles, the glass that we use in windows, in most windows, right? In regular ground floor windows, they're usually made out of what's called soda lime glass. That's because the primary material that goes in soda lime glass is uh, sodium oxide, Na2O, I think is what sodium oxide is, um, and calcium oxide, which is also known as lime. So that's what we call soda lime glass. Um, so I'm not going to go too much into this video, but the process of making this is called the Pilkington process, and it's done on molten tin, um, yeah, molten tin, and that's uh, so that we, they can get really smooth sheets. Um, uh, maybe I jumped ahead. Oh, there we go. That was what I was looking for. Right, they pour it out over this molten tin, and that's how they get it so smooth. Um, okay, so. Ceramics, we talked a little bit about spark plugs. Um, okay, before I move on, I've already moved on from spark plugs, but I should say, how do we make spark plugs? I mentioned this very briefly when we did our first chapter in year 11. I talked about the processes we use to make ceramics, right? So the first thing we can do is bricks. There are two processes we use to make bricks. What are they? Extrusion and pressing, right? If it has holes, it's extruded. If it has the frog, it's pressed, right? But for um, what what do we make using the process of slip casting? It's another ceramic that we use uh, that we produce out of slip casting. It's very smooth. We use it for things like put made out of porcelain. What's an example? Yeah, we can. Um, plates is an example, but toilets is the example I always come to, right? Just where we need a very high dimensional accuracy slip casting. Okay. I also talked about how we can use something called, um, we can use sintering, which we just talked about um, in the previous video, right? But sintering, we can press alumina as well to get that same, uh, to, to get the, to make spark plugs. We can also use it for things like, I use the example of dentistry when we talked about biomedical innovation, but sintering is another process we can use to fuse ceramics. So if there was a question that says, name the um, manufacturing process used to make spark plugs, sintering would be the answer, especially if we'll say a multiple choice question. Okay, so when we go to glass, they talk about here soda lime glass. Here we have soda, which is Na, um, Na2O, and lime, which is CaO. Um, I'm not going to go too much into this. Uh, it's used in glass bottles, um, glass bottles, uh, windows, all sorts of things. Okay, there's also lead glass, which is also called crystal. Um, so like my wife is uh, her father is from the Czech Republic and they're famous for bohemian crystal it's cut glass that sh it looks nice when light shines through it if you dip your finger into the water and then run it around the rim it makes like a sound right lead glass but it's actually they I, I like how Copeland points out it actually has not it's non-crystalline right which is kind of funny right we think about it as being crystal like but it's glass sort of line uh, lead glass is actually non-crystalline okay uh, borosilica glass we're going to talk about next. That's enough of you. I thought I had that video at the right spot, but I did not. Okay, uh, nope, not cell uh, not borosilica glass. We're going to talk instead about um, corning gorilla glass. What's gorilla glass? 
Where do we use that? What's this guy holding? It's actually an iPad, right? Or it's maybe not an iPad, but it's the, um, it, the idea is he's, he's demonstrating that this is glass that actually has flexible, flexible strength. What else is um, the glass that we use on our screens? Fam uh, what's, what are some of the properties that we really want compared to regular glass? Scratch resistance, exactly right. So if we say regular glass, soda lime glass, it has a Mohs hardness of 5.5, right? Pretty mid, pretty much middle of the scale, right? Which is lower than mild steel, right? Whereas um, Gorilla Glass has 6.5, which is means that if you put mild, if you run your keys across it, the glass scratches the keys, not the other way around. It also has another property. When we drop your phone, it's less likely to shatter. Why is that? So it has resistance to impact. What do we call that? It starts with a T. Toughness. Toughness. Exactly right. Okay, so Gorilla Glass, um, it's used because it's tough. So here we have Soda Lime Glass, and uh, they, they can show the relative scratch resistance. Again, I'll, I'll include this video where he talks. He's explaining as fast as possible. Um, okay, so now we're going to look at borosilicate glass. Borosilicate glass is used in laboratories and in um, just domestic cooking. So if you have a casserole that you put in the oven, uh, sorry, you had in the freezer and you want to take it out of the, the freezer and just put it straight into the oven, you used to be able to use Pyrex. Pyrex was a brand name for um, the people who led the way on... Um, on borosilicate glass the problem is that pyrex in america they sold the brand name and now compared to in europe where in europe it still has to be borosilicate glass in america it will just be regular soda lime glass and it will shatter in that that high temperature um, transformation so as it goes from very cold to very hot it will shatter whereas that doesn't happen with borosilicate glass so it's really important that if you buy pyrex thinking hey this will be you know good for a casserole i can put it in the freezer and then I can heat it up tomorrow, make sure that if you don't want to get a whole lot of glass out of your lasagna, that you check to make sure it has um, borosilicate glass. Okay, do they talk about Gorilla Glass? No, probably not because it's not relevant to, um, as uh, relevant to transport. Okay, um, so I think that's all it for glass. Uh, oh, I just wanted to quickly mention sintering. So this video talks about sintering of alumina. Um, it's just one of the processes, so we press it into place and then we center it. Before I move on to polymers, um, I want to talk about water, uh, water jet cutting. And we can cut glass with diamond because diamond has a much higher Mohs hardness than, uh, than glass. We can use diamond, and that is typically what we've done in the past. But if we want to cut glass uh, today in using mechanized engineering processes, we will often use water cutting, and we can see that there. There is a, I think this is a past HSC question, which says, what is the best best method to cut curve shapes in sheet glass? And uh, water jet cutting is the, is the answer there. Okay, so I'm now going to go into polymers. Uh, just before I do that, let's check your yeah, ceramics as insulating material. We talked about refractory. Um, okay, we're going to talk about polymers. So first of all, we need to know that there's a difference between um, thermosoftening polymers or thermoplastics and thermosets or thermosetting polymers. So I want people to know 11 different thermosoftening polymers. So we use PET for bottles, uh, um, HDPE, so high-density um, high polyethylene is the plastic, so nice they named it twice, the second one being low-density polyethylene. It's used for things like um, milk jugs, uh, bleach bottles, that sort of stuff. Uh, Number three is PVC. It's used for a heap of things. It's used from vinyl flooring. It's used for pipes. It's used for electrical covers um, and uh, power outlets, all of those sorts of things. It's a very widely used material. Uh, the dangerous thing is that it's poisonous when it burns. Uh, Low-density polyethylene is mainly used for shrink wrap. Uh, polypropylene, number five, is known for having a living hinge. So if I open that... So we have things like a tic-tac lid. They have a living, living hinge. And there's a video by Veritasium which talks about the, why ma machines that bend are better than machines that have hinges. Um, then we have polystyrene. Now, polystyrene is not very recyclable. In my notes, I point out how the others all have some amount of recyclability. Polystyrene is almost never recycled. Again, Veritasium has a video about um, an application of recycled poly uh, polystyrene, which can be used to prevent um, evaporation on dams. But generally, it's not recycled. It can be aerated, which we call styrofoam, or it can be um, used for things like uh, plastic knives and forks, 
or things like rulers are often made up of polystyrene. Okay, the five that we don't um, that we don't have numbers for. I like to remember cars, 3D printers, and fibers. So for cars, we have the car headlights are polycarbonate. The ta car tail lights on the A of the car is acrylic or polymethamethacrylate (PMMA). Um, we need to know that for 3D printers, we mainly use ABS. ABS is the same material used in Lego, and in this video we have the German guy say, Lego's business model is simple, buy plastic for $1 and sell it for $75. Um, ABS is a classic example of a copolymer. I'm not even going to try and pronounce the three different polymers, um, but styrene is one of them. This is styrene. Um, so... That's us talking about polymers. Um, I'm pretty sure if I, none of you will have watched Breaking Bad because I'm pretty sure it's it's rated above a, um, uh, you know 18 18 year olds. But if you did ever watch Breaking Bad, fairly early in the piece, um, they need to use some acid to get rid of a problem, and uh, the uh, um, Jesse, who is a bit of an idiot, he's sent out to go and buy a plastic tub because. The, the acid won't eat through the plastic tub, and he's told to look on the bottom, and I'm pretty sure he asked for low-density polyethylene. I, I haven't watched the video recently. Okay. Also worth mentioning is that, and this is one that's really relevant when we talk about um, transport, is... Oh, okay. Um, I got a little caught up. Sorry. I, I forgot that... Um, I, what I went, Before I jump ahead... Um, the last one is fibers, and so fibers are quite important. So we're talking mainly about aramids or polyamides, and the polyamides are used in everything from nylon, which is used for stockings, for whippersnippers. It's used um, also for things like bulletproof vests, like Kevlar is made out of polyamides, and um, also for brake pads. When we talked about brakes um, in Chapter 3 of Year 11, we talked about how asbestos fibers were replaced with polymer fibers. Now, those polymer fibers are held in a composite, and that composite has a binding agent, a glue. That glue is phenylformaldehyde. It is a thermosetting polymer. Um, so we've talked about uh, phenylformaldehyde as a thermosetting polymer. Um, thermosetting polymers have cross-linking. So this is a good time to talk about cross-linking. So if we talk about rubber, rubber is a polymer that has long ch chains of uh, monomers. And those mono they, they, those chains, just like if we had several chains um, next to each other, we'd be able to move those chains around. Even if those chains were tied to, uh, very, very long chains were tied to something like two bikes, we'd be able to move those chains around. We could move them up and down or back and forth. Whereas when we start padlocking those chains together, when we start creating crosslinks between these chains, then we're going to get much stronger, much more, um, much more difficult to move uh, chains. And that's what happens when we have thermosetting bonds. They're no longer free to move. They're no longer free to slide over each other when they get additional energy. Um, now, in the case of natural rubber, right, that grows out of trees, once a very important strategic resource in World War II, um, in 1888, uh, Dunlop, in he developed a process for making vulcanized rubber. Vulcanizing it, uh, comes from the word volcano because it uses sulfur to create these crosslinks, and that makes the uh, that makes the rubber much more wear resistant. Um, okay, what do they say? Yeah, at about five percent. Much more rigid, but fl still flexible. Um, yeah, I, it's, I believe it's also much, much more wear resistant. So um, that all of our thermosets have this three-dimensional cross-linking between uh, between the chains. So in addition to phenylformaldehyde that we talked about as being used in brake pads, we have um, polyurethane. So we've talked about polyurethane as being fake leather. Um, so that's a material used in car seats. It can also be used for foam. Um, so the foam that makes provides the cushioning, uh, but it, it's a commonly used um, thermosetting polymer. Where anything that says epoxy or resin is going to be a um, so even if we have something like polyester resin, right? If we see the word resin, we should assume that it's a thermoset. Um, silicone is the last one I want to talk about. So silicone 
is also an elastomer like rubber and so it's different to silicon right it's a silic it's a silicon based polymer but i like to pronounce it a silicone just to remind us that it's an elastomer and it's different to the metal uh silicon is used as a sealant um we have and also it's used for things like hoses and tubing in engines so I always try to remind students that it's the stuff that is on the, the corners of your shower to stop the water getting to the cracks, but it is also can be, silicon be, can be used for, um, uh, can be used for biological implants. It can be used, uh, for phone cases. It can be used for a whole bunch of, um, applications where we want something that is soft and elastic and, uh, has good water resistance. So, um, before we go on too much further, uh, I'll talk about, so we talked about engineering textiles. Here we go. So we've got polyester. Polyester, I think 60% of all polyester is made out of PET. Um, and it is used as a fabric. So it can be used for things like, again, we said car seats, like clothing often has a percentage of polyester in it. Um, but it can also be used for things like fan belts and radiator hoses. Uh, nylon. So nylon, it was, uh, we, we've already talked before, polyamides are used as fibers. So it can be used in Kevlar, but they can also be used in brake pads. Um, they're using an example of, the, it's resistant to acids and oils. Um, yeah, so we've got aramids as separate to nylon. I'm not sure why that is, but, um, okay. Last week, well, last week before we talk about, we stop talking about different kinds of polymers. We've got Teflon. Um, Teflon is interesting. So why we use it in engineering applications? Well, first of all, it was developed during the space race. Um, and it is useful because it's resistant to water vapor, not to water, but to resistant to water vapor. Um, and it can be used for filters in engines, but it's really important. We use, most people think of Teflon as being the material on their nonstick plants. And that's, that's fine. It's a great material. Um, I have, when I lived overseas, I didn't have, I didn't want to go and buy pots and pans. So I used what we had and cooking without Teflon for me was always much difficult, much more difficult than cooking with Teflon. But, um, it, it has an environmental consideration, which is that every person on the planet has some amount of Teflon in their blood. Even babies are born already with trace amounts of Teflon in their blood because uh, they get it from their mothers uh, um, in utero. So people are concerned about the fact that um, what the, this, this, these um, Teflon as a forever material could be. Uh, the same way people are worried about other microplastics. Okay, so we've got some different materials, manufacturing processes that we um, can use to make polymers. Now we've got blow molding. That's we're going to talk about that. That's important. We use that for uh, bottles. So for things like in a, a, the application of public transport, personal public transport, we use things like bottles to hold um, the wiper fluid, or um, you'll have a, a reservoir for water to keep the radiator cool. That sort of stuff. So they, they're often made out of um, a blow molded. Um, a blow molded uh, bottle. Now we will talk, watch a video for that in a second. I'm not going to talk about extru extrusion, thermoforming or calendaring. Um, again, I'm going to set that as a, a normal rotational molding. I'm going to set that as a task that I want you to read and I want you to answer a, a question or two about. Um, we're going to focus on injection molding. Injection molding is the most important um, manufacturing process for engineering states. Now I did see a trial maybe two years ago there was a question where it asked how would you make a um, a tank a, like a 400 litre tank or a 4000 litre tank for for instance a new construction um, and rotational molding would be the appropriate uh, process for that but that's pretty rare that I, I, it's definitely something that could come up but I want to try and focus on the things that are the the things that are likely to come up and focus on them um, in a big way rather than focusing on the things that are less likely to come up. So with that, well, let's keep going on. Okay, so I don't know why I have that. Okay, so geotextile fabric, it's used um, in embankments so that when we have, uh, when we create a new road 
and we go through an area where we want the road to be below the existing surface, we're going to have some uh, exposed surface. We want to prevent uh, dirt from washing away into, into filling up the drains. Also, the loss of topsoil. Topsoil is important because it has nutrients. Also, we don't want to um, have salt silt get into uh, silt being little bits of um, dirt get clog up rivers because that kills fish. So all of these reasons are, um, are why we make engineering uh, textiles, uh, geotextile fabrics, that we can use to stop the uh, erosion of embankments. It's also important in drainage. Now, neither of these, this is get becoming even less relevant to uh, personal transport, but you know, I'm using this opportunity. I think that's why I was talking about this is because I actually use this when we talked about civil structures. So what we do is we get engineering textiles and we put them inside the trench. The reason we put them inside the trench is if we don't, what will happen is that uh, mud will clog up the, uh, the pipe. We use slotted pipe. And mud will get into that, and it will clog up the pipe, and it will stop working. When the pipe, when the drainage stops working, your house floods. So you don't want your house to flood. And then you use crushed stone as well. Okay, so moving on. Okay, so I really want to focus. The most important manufacturing process for plastics is them. Sorry, is injection molding. It's slightly different if you're injection molding um, thermoplastics versus thermosets. Uh, we can see differences in terms of like the, you know, we have two hoppers for thermoplastics, we have a tapered screw. With thermosets, they actually produce their own heat. Now we do still usually heat up the, the screw, but it is worth pointing out that um, because it the process is exothermic, it actually does produce its own heat, so that helps to um, to create the melt. Now, um, we have some in animations. I don't know if I included this animation, which you know is worthwhile. Now, Right at the first assessment task, I um, talked about a 2014 paper that I didn't write that said, what are the three, pro three um, the process of injection molding exists, uh, consists of three stages, and I asked people to come up with three stages. So I've said that feedstock is fed into a hopper. This is fed into the barrel until sufficient melt has built up at the front of the screw, and the fill shot is injected into the mold and allowed to cool. Let's watch this animation and see what we think. Okay, so what heating elements? We've got three zones of the screw. We've got um, the so because this is a thermo softening softening polymer, we've got granules rather than um, uh, powder. Um, when we've got a sufficient fill shot at, um, at the front of the screw, we then it will be injected. Now they've simplified the fact that there's cooling because we want this to set as quickly as possible just so we can get as much going on as possible. It's allowed to cool and then the screw retracts. We're not as interested in that. The part is ejected. Now usually the the part will have, uh, we won't just inject one, we won't just do one thing at a time. So let's say we're doing these two things, right? Let's imagine that that's the case. We're, we're doing these two things. We might have, um, we might do two of them together at the same time. We might do 12 at the same time. And then we remove the object from the sprue. So uh, let's go back to... Okay, so these are the three steps I just said. But I also have a more in-depth answer here. So th feedstock for a thermoset powder um, or a liquid setting agent is gravity fed because we've said it's a um, thermoset. So we've said thermosetting powder and a liquid setting agent is gravity fed into a hopper. This is fed into a heated barrel where they react chemically into su sufficient melt is built up at the front of the screw and the fill shot is injected into the mold and allowed to cool or cure is another term. Uh, the mold then opens out to eject the tree. The sprue and runners are later removed from the finished product. Okay, so that's a little bit more of an adv advanced answer. I'm not looking for that, but I just want to, you know, be complete. Okay, we have that engineering guy. Um, big fan of that engineering guy. And he has a good video on injection molding. If you felt as though, hey, I want to learn more about injection molding, I've got you covered here. Um, so... He's got at the screw that we can see behind him, and he talks about how it's incredibly versatile in what we can use. 
Um, if you ever have to ask for a question that says name, if it's spe especially if it's not a multiple choice question, um, in that particular question I talked about the tank that was rotation molded. I don't think injection molded was e injection molding was even an option, right? They took that one out. But if you have an open question where you can write in an answer, if you write injection molding, it's pretty much always I, I'm always going to give it correct, right? So I can't answer for everyone. Um, I, c I can't predict future HSCs, but I'm going to say that it's always going to be a suitable answer for me. Um, anyway, so he goes into a lot of detail um, and I think you know, relatively interesting. So we're going to talk about blow molding. So with blow molding, we have a preform and that preform is injection molded. This thing here, the green thing is injection molded. What we do is we then heat it up and then we um, high pressure blows the bottle into the shape of the mold and then it's ejected. Oh, okay, they didn't really show the injection. Oh, yeah, no, they didn't. Yeah, they do show the injection. Good, there you go. Um, okay, so that's blow molding. I was also going to talk about vacuum forming, even though it's not talked about in this specific part of the book. Sometimes um, I like to put things together where I think they're relevant. Okay, so vacuum folding, the simplest method is you heat up some plastic, you put it over a mold, you vacuum the plastic onto the mold. And here you can see that um, this cat shape has been vacuum molded. Okay, that's the simplest um, explanation. Let's see what it looks like in practice. So what we have here is um, this guy's got a sheet and you can see it's actually a relatively thick sheet because this is gonna be for a suitcase and they need to be um, quite impact resistant. They they get thrown around and they're you know, exposed to a lot of wear. Um, and here's one that he's already heated up, so he's got two running at the same time. You can see that they blow the air up and then they um, they vacuum it onto the shape. So um, then we can just see what that looks like in cross section. We have that here. Okay, and that's how we get the again it's it's removed from the mold and it might be machined to be cleaned up okay that covers everything that i'm going to talk about in this video and the next thing we're going to talk about in class is going to be um, electricity and electronics but i won't be recording videos for those i already have videos that cover all of that content